Dr. Amanda Freeman. I'm a director of undergraduate studies and a lecturer in Emory Center for Study of Human Health. Today we're going to talk about GABA. What is GABA? This is a human brain. It weighs roughly three pounds and consists of almost 100 billion neurons. Just for perspective, the height of a stack of 100 billion $1 bills would measure almost 6,800 miles. This is sufficient to reach from here to the International Space Station and back 14 times. The neurons in the human brain are not all identical and can be seen in this image of a discrete region of the brain. This picture happens to be of a rat brain, but the same holds true for a human brain. This piece of tissue is stained with a chemical that makes the cell body of neurons blue. You'll notice that some of the neurons are packed tightly and some are more widely spaced. Some of the neurons are large and some are tiny. Similar to these differences in their physical characteristics, neurons have different functions and methods of communicating with other neurons. This highly magnified image shows an individual neuron and the red arrow is pointing to the cell body of the neuron. Neurons range in size and the smallest ones have a cell body that is four microns in diameter. A micron is one one thousandth of a millimeter. And the largest is approximately 100 microns in diameter. This is the same as the thickness of a piece of paper that you would put in the printer. So imagine if you look at the edge of a piece of paper, how tiny even the largest neuron is. This cartoon illustrates the flow of information between two neurons. If we take a closer look at the junctions between these two neurons, we'll notice that there are discrete locations where the two neurons are close enough to communicate. These structures are called synapses. Each neuron has an estimated 1,000 to 10,000 synapses, which means that there are 100 trillion or 1 quadrillion synapses throughout our entire brain. We refer to the upstream neuron, the blue one, as the presynaptic neuron, and the downstream neuron, the red one, as the postsynaptic neuron. Communication from the presynaptic neuron tells the postsynaptic neuron how it should act. Can you imagine having 1,000 to 10,000 people telling you how to behave? Now, let's take an even closer look at the synapse. The presynaptic neuron communicates with the postsynaptic neuron by releasing chemicals, referred to as neurotransmitters, which bind to receptors on the surface of the postsynaptic neuron. The types of neurotransmitters released and the types of receptors present determine the type of communication that can occur. Again, if we liken this to our communication, our words are like the neurotransmitters which relay our message to another person. Each word has a different meaning, much like the different types of neurotransmitters. For example, yes communicates a very different message from no. An excitatory neurotransmitter drives activity in the postsynaptic neuron. We can think of this as go or yes. An inhibitory neurotransmitter decreases activity in the postsynaptic neuron. We can think of this as stop or no. L-glutamic acid, better known as glutamate, is the principal excitatory neurotransmitter in the brain. Glutamate is used to communicate at approximately 50% of the synapses in our brain. That means that half of our synapses are GO synapses. Gamma-aminobutyric acid, better known as GABA, is the principal inhibitory neurotransmitter of our brain. GABA is used to communicate at approximately 40% of the synapses in our brain. The remaining synapses in our brain use other neurotransmitters to communicate, including acetylcholine, dopamine, norepinephrine, serotonin, and others. These neurotransmitters can be excitatory or inhibitory depending upon the receptor present. If we continue the analogy with our communication, these neurotransmitters are like homonyms. The same one can have different meanings. For example, the word row can refer to moving a boat with oars, as in row a boat, 
or it can be a line of things, like a row of chairs. The meaning depends upon the context. In neuronal communication, the context is determined by the postsynaptic receptors. Now that we know what GABA is, let's talk about what GABA has to do with sleep regulation. There are multiple neurotransmitter systems that use the brain to promote wakefulness. These include histamine, serotonin, norepinephrine, acetylcholine, and hypocretin or orexin. These systems have overlapping projections that are widespread throughout the brain. This redundancy indicates the importance of wakefulness and the need for a backup system to maintain wakefulness should one of these systems be disrupted. Now, we know in the case of narcolepsy with cataplexy, or type 1 narcolepsy, that the redundancy does not perform perfectly when hypocretin or orexin is lost. Otherwise, these patients would not fall asleep at inappropriate times. Although there are five wake-promoting neurotransmitters, there is only one neurotransmitter system that promotes sleep. This is GABA. Think about that for a moment. Five systems promote wakefulness, and only one promotes sleep. In the past, it has been thought that when there is a deficit in wakefulness, as in hypersomnia, that one of the five neurotransmitter systems was broken. The fact that a loss of function results from a loss of brain activity is common. Think about stroke or Parkinson's disease. We know that particular functions, like movement, are disrupted due to the loss of activity in the brain. Even in the example of narcolepsy with cataplexy, it is clear that a loss of function may potentially underlie sleep disorders as well. This publication by Dr. David Rye and colleagues at Emory University first described GABA-related hypersomnia. This paper brought to light the possibility that a deficit in wakefulness could be due to excessive activity of the sleep-promoting system. So rather than a loss of function, this was a gain of function. What does it mean to have excessive activity of the GABA system? Since GABA is the inhibitory neurotransmitter, this means that there's too much inhibition in the brain and a stronger drive to sleep dominates the wake-promoting effects of other neurotransmitter systems. Not only did this publication represent a paradigm shift in the way we think about excessive sleepiness, the researchers identified a substance in the cerebral spinal fluid, although still unnamed, that increases GABA's inhibitory effects. When GABA is applied to cells experimentally, we can record the resulting inhibition that is shown as a downward dip in this figure. If the cerebral spinal fluid from a patient with GABA-related hypersomnia is applied to the same cells by itself, there is no response. However, if the substance is applied simultaneously with GABA, this combination potentiates the resulting inhibition. In other words, the inhibition is stronger. In fact, in this figure, the inhibition is twice as strong. That's the difference between someone saying stop and someone yelling stop. It turns up the volume on the inhibition and hence the overpowering sleep drive. This method of examining the substance and its effect on GABA signaling is time and labor intensive. Not knowing what the substance is also limits the different ways in which we can examine where it comes from and what it does. Understanding the possibility that too much GABA underlies the excessive sleepiness and hypersomnia is important because it represents a change in the way we think about how sleep and wake are regulated. Since we still have many questions about the substance and the mechanisms by which it is causing excessive sleepiness, it is important to support ongoing research.